Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. They're calling this happy hour now in the newsroom. This hour, just with those of us here on Bloomberg, get to talk before we unleash this program on our global television audience at 1 p.m. And this is where we think the big thoughts. How would you like to be Mike Johnson today? You thought you were stressed out this morning. Maybe you woke up in the middle of the night. You didn't know what was going to happen at work on Tuesday. Imagine being Mike Johnson. No path forward on Ukraine. Big questions about Israel. A motion to vacate hanging over your head. And all that after you handle FISA, the warrantless spying program that has been controversial since the day it appeared. So this is the day. The traffic jams are back. They're back in town. And they have two weeks to get something done. Can anything happen? I wonder what Terry Haynes thinks about it. I'm glad to say Terry's with us on this uh, important day back. Pangea Policy founder on Bloomberg. Terry, it's good to see you. You look happy and ready. Is there hope in the air something gets done? And I'm asking you that with a pretty long laundry list. We have this great story on the terminal right now. Trains, planes, and TikTok. Where do you want to begin? How about Pfizer? Oh, goodness. Does uh, it happen I'll, I'll begin in with, the next two weeks? Well, sure. Yeah, I'll begin with happiness. Why not? I'll begin with happiness. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, answer is, the answer is probably no. Um, you know, it's uh, to borrow a Churchill phrase. It's not the beginning of the end, but it's probably the end of the beginning. Uh, you know, one of the things I've, uh, I've learned and been a part of in many years is that uh, when Cong- Congress comes back on Monday, nobody ever begins to grapple with anything until Wednesday. That's just generally what happens. Right. And you've got, uh, you know, you've got uh, party conferences and, and all the rest. Uh, you know, this is probably a, a good reminder that uh, the best politics takes place uh, in a personal space. And, uh, you know, so sure. they haven't begun to solve any of this stuff. Johnson's got a problem. And there's really two problems in Washington. And then I'll stop. One is that Johnson's got a very mm-hmm. fractious uh, Republican conference he has to deal with. And he's trying to figure out ways to provide Ukraine aid and, you know, and and trying pretty much everything he can think of from uh, from uh, poo pooing straight aid, but talking about uh, loans and and uh, loan guarantees and the Biden administration are talking about bonds and the like with uh, the rest of the uh, the G7 and NATO, uh, you know, and all the way down to a kind of a lend-lease program uh, that uh, people haven't heard of since right. uh, Franklin Roosevelt. But the other problem is, um, and I'm not being partisan by saying so, but the other partisan is, uh, problem here is, is that I think President Biden is not doing enough, not doing anything really to impose a view of what is in the United States' best interest and kind of a unifying foreign policy vision in the way that past presidents of both parties have done. And he Mm -hmm. very much needs to to come to the table on this and really push instead of just saying that the Congress needs to do something. Yeah, well, so here's my big question on that, Terry, because we've got a couple of competing discharge petitions as another way maybe to get to Ukraine funding, uh, competing versions. One is more uh, Democratic and the other is Republican. Uh, And they actually have folks signing on here. So I guess my question is, what's more likely now? And I don't mean to sneak up on you, but I'm curious how you'd answer this. What's more likely, a motion to vacate? is triggered by a Marjorie Taylor Greene or a discharge petition actually sees the light of day and saves the speaker from having to act? I'll go non-consensus. You know, most Washington people, I think, would say that <laughs> yeah. uh, it's going to be the Green motion the, to vacate. Um, I think the discharge petition is much more likely. You know, what, what you've got in Washington, and, you know, you and I have talked many times on this in the past, is you don't have two political parties. You've got four factions. Yeah. And right now you've got uh, the, the vast majority of the Congress, which are Republican centrists and Democratic centrists, really pushing hard to do something on Ukraine aid on Israel aid, on Indo-Pacific aid. And, uh, and you know, th- that... Uh, 
I think that kind of starts to overwhelm things uh, pretty soon. Folks have been pretty patient uh, about understanding the travails of uh, Republican leadership, but uh, we're getting to the point now where something has to happen, and that pressure, I think, frankly, is more meaningful in the in the House uh, than what uh, uh, what Ms. Green is doing. Yeah, well, you know, a discharge petition is one of these things that journalists love to talk about and, you know, act like this happens all the time. And of course, never had kind of like a contested convention. Like, yeah, good luck with that in four years. But in this case, what would that say about this Congress, Terry, if it actually did happen, if it was required to get something done? Oh, well, it would uh, it would confirm that there really <laughs> excuse me, it would confirm that there really aren't uh, majorities and there's really not control Uh you know, one of the things I, I, I say to you and others a lot is that uh, don't don't assume majorities mean control. And that's, you know, very true. Yeah. And I think coming very more very much obvious uh, in the uh, in the in the House currently. Uh, and it would be the same, frankly, if there was a five vote Democratic majority or a one vote mm -hmm. Democratic majority. There wouldn't really be control. Uh, but what you've got is you've got kind of the mass of uh, of rank and file pushing back against leaders, uh, frankly, in both parties, uh, to say, look, you know, we this is much more this issue is much more important than party discipline, which is already very much attenuated anyway. So, uh, sure. you know, we need to be doing something about this sooner rather than later. And so the threat of a discharge petition, uh, you know, they don't generally don't happen, but the threat of them is a very real one uh, that that compels uh, leaders to act and figure out different ways to do things. That I think that's what's yeah. happening to Johnson right now. I was really fascinated by comments from Dusty Johnson, the South Dakota Republican, as chair of the Main Street Republican Caucus, and he was asked about this idea of a motion to vacate, talking to Politico says there's a 100% chance, this is a direct quote, that after the motion to vacate, which, by the way, he does not support, we will be left with a speaker that is less conservative than Mike Johnson. And for people like me who want to secure conservative victories, that would be a tragedy. Does Mike Johnson, with this in mind, need to spend more time with the Freedom Caucus right now or more time with Democrats who could potentially protect him and help him save his job? Um, I think he needs to. Stop. I'm going to take neither in that. I think he needs to spend more time with his Republican centrists and the uh, kind of the back. Like Dusty Johnson. Place. Well, yeah, like Dusty Johnson, because what you've got is you've got let's call him. Uh, I think of Johnson as kind of a centrist, but let's just call him a pragmatic conservative because pragmatism is where I want right. to go here. Um, is that you know is, is that there's a there's a there are bigger issues involved here uh, than just the back and forth about whether somebody's going to uh, you know land in the chair after uh, after the the game of uh, you know mixing up and, and jumping on the uh, jumping on the last chair available uh, and. Yes. You know, it's to say it's going to be a bad look for Republicans should a discharge petition succeed doesn't uh, doesn't really describe the half of it. These people are fighting for a majority. They're going to prove uh, for a continued majority in the fall elections. They're going to prove they don't deserve one. And not only that, they're going to squander advantages that they have somewhat incredibly on economic mm -hmm. uh, issues and a bunch of other things. Uh, it's going to occur to. It'll be a spice in the fall elections in individual member Congress and Senate races uh, that these folks aren't up to it and uh, and shouldn't be put back in charge. Uh, you know, and that's the kind of fire Miss Green is really playing with. But then again, she'd probably prefer to be in the minority anyway, where she could uh, you know raise money from purists. Isn't that interesting? Terry, it's good to see you. Great to catch up. Congress back in town had to have Terry Haynes from Pangea Policy, uh, a regular voice of reliability and rational thought here on Bloomberg. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. With this in mind, the idea of Ukraine funding specifically, but also to an extent Israel funding, and they will get a vote at some point likely combined on the House floor. We hear so much about the DIB, the defense industrial base that this bill would help to fund the majority of the money staying here in the U.S. The vast majority of the $60 billion for Ukraine would go to defense contractors here in the states. American jobs, that's the idea. Terry's talking about why haven't we heard from the president on this, at least to the extent that we thought we would, when it comes to the domestic investment. And we're not alone here in the U.S., I will point you to a fascinating story today on the terminal and at Bloomberg.com. Our colleague Enda Curran, who we talk to a lot here, and a great group of reporters at Bloomberg put this together uh, about the global need. In fact, the Western world uh, has a need to invest in its domestic 
defense industrial base. U.S. and allies face a $10 trillion reckoning in the race to rearm is the headline. And I'm happy to say that Enda is with us right now. Bloomberg Global Economy Reporter. Nice to see you, sir. Great work here. Um, it's, uh, it, it really gives you a sense of where the money is going to be going in the next couple of years to the extent that it might put some Western uh, nations into a, some very difficult positions uh, when they have to decide on how to allocate funding. You're talking about a new era of global rearmament. This is the Western world, as I put it, right? This is NATO and beyond. Yeah, it's the old guns and butter argument has come back to life. So to be clear, the national security people will tell you you have to spend on defense. But that means you're going to spend a lot of money. You're going to have to find that money from somewhere. And our economists at Bloomberg Economics had a look at, let's just say the G7, including the US, if they were to include or increase their spending up to 4%, of GDP, which is where Poland is at the moment on, on defense spending. Mm-hmm. You're then, that's where you get into this $10 trillion figure. It's a lot of money. And remember, hitting that 2% figure is very pertinent in Western Europe sure now. Those, those NATO allies are racing to hit that. And of course, if the US presidency changed later this year, it would be even sharper focus. So yeah. defense costs money. It's really interesting that that's become like a household thing. People know about 2% now. In many uh, ways, because of Donald Trump having beat the drum on this for so long, now it's become part of the sort of daily conversation in Washington. Let's keep it to the G7 for a minute. To your point, which nations will suffer the most in, in terms of domestic obligations that they're already making? So it depends ultimately how to do. Do they fund this um, defense procurement through increasing taxes? Yeah. Do they fund it through faster economic growth, growing the revenue pile? Or, of course, you'd have to go and borrow on the markets, right? So it does depend on how to do it. But you'd have to say a lot of analysts point towards the the old reliables of Italy and Spain, for example, among the sovereigns in Western Europe, who already have some uh, challenges there that they would come under further pressure under a kind of debt profile if they were to go down the road of funding this uh, through borrowing. So the likes of Germany and UK could maybe absorb it a bit better. Um, But let's not forget, even the US, some analysts here make the point that US spending is nowhere near where it needs to be for the challenges that the world is facing both in Europe and Asia. So it's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to cost a lot of money. Great line from uh, Jenny Welch, our colleague uh, at Bloomberg Economics, a geoeconomics analyst. The post-Cold War peace dividend is coming to an end. Is this a new arms race? It is because it's not just Western Europe, by the way, uh, or even the US. Yeah. Uh, China increasing spending this year by 7%, most in five years. Others in Asia, like the Philippines and and Malaysia, uh, racing ahead. Australia investing in its navy, likewise Japan. So a lot of countries around the world are turning their focus to where to put their money into defense. The question, this is where the whole guns and butter question comes into it. Will they be making painful decisions elsewhere? Uh, You know, there are those who say you can't balance the budget on on defense. So will they find cuts elsewhere or will they have both guns and butter Mm -hmm. and not make the hard choices? That's where the economic angle comes into all of this. You mentioned China. This is because of China, right? And and Russia. Not to mention the chaos in the Middle East. Quite right. So Russia's invasion of Ukraine, China's aggression in in the South China Sea uh, and, of course, the Middle East. All of this is stoking, as you know well, this kind of renewed focus, this new, renewed thinking on protecting borders. What do we need to do? How much kit do we need to buy? And how do we buy it? You mentioned the U.S. here. Uh, we have our own reckoning uh, at some point. We can't even seem to get Ukraine funding through the door, and a lot of that would help us domestically. Uh, is it time to take a new look at defense spending levels here, or is it about the rest of the world catching up to us? There's certainly an element of catch-up, and that's very true of Western Europe in yeah. terms of NATO obligations. So that's something that came through in these reporting reporting lines. So there is that for sure. The U.S. has been carrying its load. But uh, when it comes to U.S. budget, mm-hmm. writ large, there are plenty of warnings that it's on an unsustainable trajectory. Now, that's your starting point. Now, where you want to start making your cutbacks or finding savings is a whole other story. There are people who say you shouldn't be finding those savings in defense, you shouldn't be finding it in education or whatever. But yes, there are plenty of people saying the U.S. needs to keep an eye on the public purse at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, your Larry Summers is your CBOs, whatever. So sure. uh, it comes down to the debate of where you want to make those It's cuts. really something, though, because I keep waking up to stories every day telling me about cheap drones that this is less expensive than ever, that they're telling us that we don't need all this expensive stuff. Yeah, well, so I, have to, I can't claim to be a military hardware expert. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I came with this through the public, <laughs> you know, the public spending view. But yeah. I, again, this did come up in conversations. You can spend a ton of money on heavy equipment these days, yeah. and all it takes some cheap drones to cause havoc and mayhem, as we see in the Red, red yeah. Sea. Sometimes you wonder if we're going back to the 1980s here a little bit. You're not old enough to remember that, I know. Uh, and, uh, I certainly am. <laughs> I know you are. It's great to see you back. I have to try to make him feel better. Enda Curran is old like I am.
And great to have him with us, as always, on the set here in Washington. Bloomberg Global Economy Reporter. Find that story. It's a fascinating read and a lot more than we uh, even had a chance to scratch here on our conversation. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Kaylee, drama, I guess, is what we have in common. Yes, there's always drama here in Washington. You know what reminds me of more drama that we haven't even mentioned yet? Tomorrow is when the House is going to send the articles of impeachment against the Department of Homeland Security <laughs> Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate, where it likely will go nowhere. It might quickly right. uh, die. And yet that just speaks to the powers that be in Washington and how much they disagree with each other yeah, that's on true. most things. He's right going to be up there tomorrow testifying, right? While yes, the articles in the Senate. are. But that is, you're right, the stagecraft mm-hmm. as they walk the. The, the, the mahogany box with the articles across the rotunda. We'll actually see that tomorrow. And then they will, I guess, fall into a hole somewhere because we're not expecting a trial in the Senate. No, it seems like Schumer is going to try to put this thing to bed very quickly. We'll see whether or not he ultimately has success in doing so. But that's what we'll learn more immediately this week. It may be some time, weeks even, before we understand what exactly Ukraine aid might be in the House, what form it will take, when it could be put to the floor, and of course, what could happen as a consequence. And here to keep track of all of that is Eric Wasson. He is a congressional reporter for us here at Bloomberg, joining us live from Capitol Hill today. So Eric, the lawmakers are back where you are, at least starting to trickle into town. What's going to be the first order of business? Well, in the House, they're really focused on this FISA warrantless surveillance bill. This is a very divisive bill, both among Republicans and Democrats, this balance of privacy and security. And, uh, you know, the Speaker has decided to focus on this and put off Ukraine at least for another week. Uh, We're told that there won't be a Ukraine proposal put forward this week as he works to generate at least uh, more than half of his conference behind uh, a Ukraine proposal. Uh, And we may see it next week, but then the House goes on uh, recess again. Uh, continuing to push this <laughs> off, but it is it is it is the issue that could trigger his ouster. Uh, we're on uh, full alert for Marjorie Taylor Greene to introduce a resolution, uh, and that's the main drama in the House right now. And as you mentioned in the Senate, it will be Alejandro Mayorkas, uh, you know, being triggered uh, as far as an impeachment trial uh, tomorrow late. Uh, in the day, uh, and we're expecting the Democrats to bring a a, a motion to dismiss that uh, as soon as Thursday. So that's really the focus uh, in the Senate. There had been some thought uh, before tax day of bringing this big $78 billion business tax uh, and child tax break bill, but all my sources are saying that is on hold, it's on ice until they can find some way to overcome a Senate Republican uh, blockade of that. Boy, is anyone, Eric, questioning the calendar here? The extent to which this looks ridiculous that after just coming back from a a two week Easter recess, this massive to do list that lawmakers could potentially go back on recess before anything is done. I mean, certainly, but this is an election year so that we've come to expect that to a certain degree in Congress as members want to be back campaigning. But I think also, uh, you know, the speaker is treading on a landmine, uh, you know, minefield of problems here. So perhaps these breaks just gather him, give him a little bit more time in there to, to, to adjust this learning curve, which has been very steep for Speaker Johnson. Well, and speaking of Speaker Johnson, as we You mentioned, Eric, and we have talked about Marjorie Taylor Greene, clearly unhappy with the speaker and some of the choices that he has made. She outlined everything she feels Johnson has done wrong in a letter to her colleagues yesterday. And in part, she said in the letter that Johnson has presided over what she calls a complete and total surrender to Democrats and President Biden and needs to change course or be unseated. But isn't the fact of the matter, Eric, that the Democrats will still hold the Senate? The Democrats will still hold the White House. So any future Republican speaker, whether or not it's Mike Johnson or someone else, is going to have the exact same problem. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. I think you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene and others were very unhappy with the outcome of these two minibuses. This was to fund the federal government, avoid a shutdown. Uh, you know, the speaker uh, touted some conservative wins, but they clearly wanted much more. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene in particular wanted all the Trump investigations by Jack Smith to be defunded. That's something that would never pass. The, the Senate would possibly cause even cause a shutdown. And, and the speaker and other Republican leaders made the calculation that a shutdown in election year by Republicans is not good politics, would not help them keep the house so that those requests fell on deaf ears uh, that prompted her to bring this attempt to uh, 
to oust him. So, I mean, uh, she's unhappy, but, you know, we have Democrats, you know, Tom Suozzi, the newly uh, returned New York representative, Jared Moskowitz of Florida, saying that they would vote to stop her from ousting the speaker. Uh, there are probably others in there, especially if a Ukraine bill comes forward, that's something Democrats can support. So it's not really clear she'll have the ability uh, to even carry out this threat. Fascinating. We don't have any idea when a Ukraine bill might emerge do we, Eric? Never mind. Actually, get a vote on the floor. Yeah, not. Th I'm told not this week. So don't don't be uh, you know on full alert for it this week. Uh, we know that the contents, the the Repo Act, which is the idea of seizing Russian assets, Democrats and Republicans mm -hmm. like that. That could be added in. It's the idea of loans that uh, President, former President Trump is talking about. Loans that may never be repaid, uh, incidentally, uh, from Ukraine is something that's going to be part of it. Uh, and this is push for LNG exports. And, and uh, my colleague Ari Natter had a nice piece. It's not just lifting a pause on current LNG uh, export projects, but specifically approving certain projects, uh, including by certain companies in, in Louisiana. So, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's in the mix as well. He's back on the Hill. Eric Wasson, Bloomberg congressional reporter. It's like the first day of school up there, Kaylee. Do I keep going out of order for you? You were about to speak. Forgive me if I am. It's okay. It's you know, we finish right. each other's it's sentences. Like it's it's kind of, it is a jazz band. We're all mm -hmm. just riffing. But it, it's an excellent point, as we discussed with Eric, the idea that there is going to be a lot of question around foreign aid. It's mm -hmm. not just the questions around aid for Ukraine, but Israel as well, especially in light of growing criticism of the Israeli government here at home domestically. President Biden certainly is included in the group that is growing Absolutely. more critical. But other international pressures are abound for Israel, including the latest today, Turkey, mm -hmm. after Israel opposed its proposal to drop aid over the Gaza Strip, decided to restrict exports to Israel of 54 different items until there is a ceasefire deal. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's something as well to consider this idea of a date on a Rafah invasion, which yes. we don't have. Benjamin Netanyahu says one exists. Uh, while we also talk about a potential ceasefire, is this all the same conversation? Is this all public negotiating for a lack of negotiating at the table, you kind of wonder what to believe at this point. Well, especially when we're hearing different levels of optimism from the Israelis over yeah. the prospect of a ceasefire deal being reached versus Hamas, which suggested yesterday that we're not getting as close as the Israelis Absolutely. might suggest. So this is where we want to begin with Mark Ginsburg. He is the former U.S. ambassador to Morocco and the founder and president of Coalition for a Safer Web. Ambassador Ginsburg, it's always great to have you here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Let's First, focused on this idea of a ceasefire deal. Clearly, there is growing international pressure for this to happen. It seems the Israelis are becoming more optimistic, but how optimistic would you be that this can happen soon? Well, I'm not optimistic. I'm not optimistic because it's not done until it's done. And Hamas uh, leadership thinks that they have more balls in their court than the Israelis do because they see the pressure growing by the Biden administration uh, and democratic progressives to restrict aid to military assistance to Israel. And Hamas is saying, hey, this is terrific. We can get the Biden administration completely tied up against Israel. And that means that we'll be able to live the fight another day because the Israelis will have a harder time to fight in Gaza. So is that uh, who Benjamin Netanyahu was talking to yesterday? Was Hamas the audience to, to, see, to say publicly that there was a date established for the invasion of Rafa without actually saying what it was, knowing how much pressure the U.S. is putting on him right now to keep that from happening? Well, it's not only pressure from Netanyahu on, the, on Hamas. It's also pressure by the Netanyahu far-right extremist government on the Biden administration to say, look, uh, we haven't completed the task of what Netanyahu defines uh, euphemistically as complete victory even though I don't believe there's such a thing as complete victory. And so you've got a lot of chess plays that are going on here between the administration, the talks in Cairo, Hamas and Iran, and the Israelis. And each one at this point in time is pointing fingers at, at the other over why there's no agreement on a ceasefire. Well, and there's other mediators involved in these negotiations as well, Ambassador Egypt and Qatar. How should we be thinking about them as factors here when officials from the Israeli government have suggested to Bloomberg within the last week that they don't uh, view the Qataris as, as reliable or trustworthy? The Qataris are not reliable. The Qataris are doing what's best for the Qataris. 
Uh, the Egyptians have another have, have have one major dog in this fight. If the Israelis invade Rafa, uh, and there are almost uh, what close to a million refugee Palestinian refugees in a mm -hmm. sub section part of that area, and if the Israelis attack, what are the Israelis going to do? They claim they're going to set up a tent camp for those refugees in northern Gaza. So that means that they're going to have to move them. And that means in the end also that the Rafa crossing for humanitarian aid is going to be subjected to all sorts of military restrictions that we've seen have hampered aid already. So the Egyptians at this point in time don't want to see a refugee flow into the Sinai. And so they want to see a ceasefire. So they have a much bigger dog in this fight than Qatar has. Mm -hmm. What's the next visit, Ambassador, to Tel Aviv? We've seen this continued shuttle diplomacy from Antony Blinken. We saw Joe Biden uh, make a visit as well. If the administration starts to see what it's asking for from Benjamin Netanyahu, could we see another? Well, I'm not very convinced that the Biden administration is going to be satisfied uh, by the Netanyahu administration. Uh, the fact is, is it took the president reading the riot act, and I'm exaggerating the word riot act to Netanyahu, to get him to agree after the uh, merciless killing of the World Food Kitchen uh, aid workers to open up aid. And, you know, I asked the same question I've asked for, for months. There's a major port less than 25 miles from Gaza, known as Ashdod. It is Israel's major port. Why are the Israelis refusing to permit humanitarian aid to be offloaded in Ashdod instead of the administration having to build a port, the Biden administration having to build a port in Gaza? I think that the, mm. and I'm singling out the Netanyahu government and not the Israelis or the, I, the Israeli defense mm -hmm. forces. The, the Netanyahu government cannot be trusted, cannot be trusted to play essentially with what is necessary for Israel to accomplish in order to gain a ceasefire, in order to get international support, in order to avoid restrictions on military aid. Netanyahu would love to go to war against the best friend that Israel has right now in order to supplement his political campaign to stay in power. Well, as you speak about the Netanyahu government, obviously, Ambassador, you know well, this is the farthest right government we have seen, farthest right coalition in Israel. And on that pressure, the national security minister, who is a member of a far right party, said if the prime minister decides to end the war without an extensive attack on Rafa in order to defeat Hamas, he will not have a mandate to continue serving as prime minister. Is this really all it's about for Netanyahu? Uh, yeah, that he is the Marjorie Taylor Green of the Israeli government, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, he he wants to play the game of pulling the plug on Netanyahu's coalition, when in the end, he's off to Siberia if there's an end to this coalition. So this is all pressure on Netanyahu, who has every incentive to keep the, his far-right coalition intact. Um, look, insofar as military, the military situation in Rafah, there's no doubt that the vestiges of the, of the Hamas leadership are buried underneath tunnels below Rafa. The Israelis want to go in. They can't really do it without jeopardizing the lives of more Palestinians. There's the there's a, a question over whether or not a, an alternative strategy is necessary because look, the problem is Netanyahu is is prolonging this war in my judgment by demanding what he calls complete victory, which is the utter defeat of Hamas militarily and politically. I do not consider that attainable, despite my fact that I'm the first one who would want to see that. The Israeli, the Israeli military cannot achieve that objective without first and foremost ensuring that Hamas never politically is able to restore itself to power in the rest of Gaza. And that requires a peacekeeping force and support of the Arab states. Mark Ginsburg, he's the founder and president of the Coalition for a Safer Web. He's also the former U.S. ambassador to Morocco. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for being with us. It certainly is a conversation worth remembering when we have the debate in Washington about Israeli funding, once seen as a layup, and now potentially a vote that could prohibit Ukraine funding from moving forward as progressives uh, throw red flags on what they're seeing in Gaza. 
You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Lawmakers are back on Capitol Hill after a two-week recess or district work period. And now they are walking the halls once again with a long to-do list in front of them. So joining us now is one of those members of Congress, the Republican from Oklahoma, Congressman Frank Lucas, is with us now live from the Hill. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us and welcome back to Washington. There is a lot that could be done. The question is, will a lot actually be done? What is your understanding of the first order of business? What do you think you'll be voting on first? I think uh, the FISA issue has to be addressed. I think we have to have a supplemental appropriation to address our allies around the world. That's going to include issues like the bridge collapse in Baltimore. Uh, One of my colleagues implies that she might want to give the leadership in the House Republican side a stir. So there's all manner of things going on. And that doesn't even include committee work like uh, financial services efforts dealing with the the Security Exchange Commission's climate rules. Lots of stuff, guys. Will you? You must be so excited to be back, Congressman. We're excited to have you with us here and a little honest talk about what might or might not happen. That's an interesting thing you just said. If, in fact, we do see action on funding for our allies uh, in hot wars, Ukraine, Israel, and then you've also got Taiwan there, will that also be the vehicle for emergency funding to replace that bridge in Baltimore? I have to believe that we'll pass one big package. Now, I'm not an appropriator. I'm not in leadership. I, uh, but I have to believe, based on my experience, we'll have one big package. But who would have ever guessed that the Israeli component of it would cause such ranks, rancor amongst the Democrat members of the House? Who would have guessed we would have such a discussion on the Republican side about trying to still slow down Putin, the dictator in Russia, from taking over his neighbors? Uh, when would when would have a debate about a major infrastructure piece like the the bridge in Baltimore going down? This is just a complicated set of times we're in, guys. But we have to get our work done, mm-hmm. and I'm an eternal optimist. Or I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> right, and you do have a vote, even if you aren't an appropriator or in leadership, Congressman. So it raises the question of what it is exactly you would be willing to use that vote for. Mike Johnson has suggested Ukraine aid could come to the floor uh, in potentially a different form than what we saw in the Senate for perhaps a loan uh, instead of just uh, outright aid or perhaps using frozen Russian assets. What is it that you would support? What would Ukraine aid need to look like for you for it to get your vote? Well, I won't make the final decision, but whether it's a loan or outright money, Uh, As long as it addresses all our allies around the world, as long as we make sure our friends in Taiwan can purchase purchase the resources they need, as long as we make sure the infrastructure in this country is functioning, you can't have a a port of the magnitude of importance as Baltimore stay down for an extended period. That just creates chaos throughout the system. Whatever we come up with, but it has to factor all those pieces in. There's not much legislative session left in the 2024 uh, legislative calendar. This is re-election season. This is presidential campaign year. So I would think that management on both sides of the building and both sides of the room will put all this together in whatever the ultimate form is and it'll come to the floor. And remember, we may organize by Republican caucus and Democrat caucus, but as you noted a moment ago, every member has his or her own vote to cast on behalf of their constituents. Well, that's right. And you referred to one of your colleagues. I think you might have been referring to the gentlewoman from Georgia uh, earlier. If the Speaker of the House pursues the path that you just outlined, including funding for Ukraine, will it get him fired? I think that's an issue that we'll have to decide when we get there. Will the trigger be pulled? Will the trigger be pulled, Mm -hmm. assuming we can pass the bill? What will the Democrats on the other side do? They had a lot of fun uh, by supporting a handful of my colleagues in pitching out to Speaker McCarthy. But we're now at a point in time Mm -hmm. where having fun, political gain, is not in the best interest of ourselves or our allies. They're going to have to be responsible too. The whole body elects the Speaker. The whole body has to make the decision about removing a Speaker. But as you point out, Congressman, eight of your Republican conference colleagues did vote to oust McCarthy back in the fall. Do you think there would be eight or even any more than just one single vote, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who would be willing to cast a vote like that again? Have you heard of anyone who is on her side when it comes to this question around a motion to vacate? I have not heard of anyone out there rattling the saber to bring his speakership to an end. 
besides one member. Okay. That's interesting because we're hearing of, from a few Democratic members who've said that they might move to help protect the Speaker and not have to go through this whole ordeal again. Is that the way this ends? He brings Ukraine funding to the floor, uh, supported by Republicans like yourself and Democrats in an effort to keep his job if Democrats are standing by? The speaker has a responsibility to bring the best possible packages to the floor in the interest of the country, in the interest of our allies. We have a responsibility to step up and vote on that. Farm bills mm -hmm. always are bipartisan. NDAAs are always bipartisan. The appropriation bills in normal times are always bipartisan. We just have to uh, let the body work its will. I have faith in the body. Well, and of course, Congressman, the body doesn't always necessarily agree with itself or at least the different parties within the body on certain issues. And FISA is an example. You mentioned at the top that that is on your to-do list. There are really bipartisan members who have concerns on either end, one being the more intelligence oriented who want to make sure that warrant warrantless surveillance can continue. On the other side, you have those looking for more privacy protections for Americans who may be caught up in this kind of, of surveillance. Where do you fall on this issue, sir? Will you vote? either way or is there one that you would prefer to see the speaker put forward the first key element in fisa is it is a temporary authorization it's not permanent law so it reflects the times we live in maybe we're not being attacked every day on the shores of the united states but our allies our friends around the world are under, under assault both economically and militarily we have an obligation to use the resources that are necessary to protect ourselves and to protect our allies when we have a common mutual interest, voting for language that continues that security. Because if anyone thinks that the Chinese Communist Party, if anyone thinks that Mr. Putin's dictatorship is, trying, is not trying to use every available resource to disrupt democracies in the West, you're pretty damn naive. Interesting scenario to see a bill that, of course, Joe Biden is pushing, and I know Republicans like yourself uh, are pushing as well. Mike Pompeo has been briefing uh, members in the House to underscore the urgency and the need for funding in Ukraine. Whose argument is resonating with your caucus? I don't know that I can answer that question at this moment. I believe that when my colleagues sit down and look at the intelligence, when they look at the information coming from the appropriate committees, when they look at the world situation, they realize you cannot let Mr. Putin prevail in the Ukraine. Why else would his neighbors in Finland and Sweden, after being neutral for decades or centuries, so frantically joined a NATO? They fear that this is the beginning of another 1930s, and they don't want to be occupied as their grandparents' generation was in the 1930s and 40s. It's a very fair point, Congressman, and, and that is one that we have uh, heard a lot of national security-minded folks make. But of course, to Joe's point, that's not everyone singing the same tune. Obviously, it may be weeks before you actually have a chance to vote on this issue. But more immediately, tomorrow, as you alluded to at the beginning of this interview, you will be sitting in a financial services committee hearing looking specifically at the SEC's new climate disclosure rules. And it's worth noting, Congressman, that just last week, the SEC announced that it was pausing implementation to allow the legal fight surrounding these disclosures play out. What role do you see Congress playing that the courts wouldn't be playing here? Should you not just be waiting for the courts to decide either way? We provide oversight, we provide focus, we make sure people understand what Chairman Gensler and the SEC is up to. They started this rulemaking process two years ago. This was all about putting the federal government in a control position over environmental issues that they could not get Congress when they controlled the House and the Senate and Joe Biden was the president, couldn't get it passed into law. So they won't intend to use the rulemaking process. Now, we put enough spotlight over the course of the last two years on what the SEC was up to that they had to back off. Supposedly they stepped away from some of scope three. They've delayed implementation of this and that and the other. I would suggest to you, if their rule in its present form, even with the delays that they implied they'll make, or is in place, it'll still cause corporate boards, corporations, and entities who do business with them to have to report all this stuff anyway. That's not something that should be done by fiat from a rulemaking bureaucracy in the federal government. 
If we're going to do this, it needs to be a piece of legislation. But clearly, Congress, Republican or Democrat, doesn't want to go the way that Chairman Gisler wants to go. Thank goodness we're here standing in front of him. So there will be a legislative answer? I would say there will be the necessary oversight and focus so that everyone understands what's going on. I don't know that you'll have a, quote, legislative fix, but if we hadn't raised the attention, if we had not made clear to people what the chairman was up to at the Securities Exchange Commission, we would have not had the mm -hmm. dropping a part of his scope three rule. We would have not had the delays in implementation of other things. If we had been quiet, they would have done it to us by rulemaking fiat, and it would not have been good for the American economy or the American business. Well, of course, sir, it's not just the Financial Services Committee you sit on. You sit on the Agriculture Committee as well. And another issue that the SEC is heavily involved in that really straddles both of those committees on which you sit is crypto, given that it's very unclear what is a security and what is a commodity, perhaps, uh, like in the case uh, of Bitcoin, or at least Bitcoin not being a security. It does get a bit com complicated, Congressman, and it does so because there has been no clear delineation at this point between what the SEC should have control over and what the CFTC should have control over. And your two committees did attempt to address that in a market structure bill that passed last year in the summer. Do you have any understanding of whether or not that's going to be able to move forward in this Congress? What are each of your committees up to on that? We're not seeing a lot of action now at this stage. And remember in financial services, we've had an incredible number of crypto related hearings at full committee, at subcommittee mm -hmm. down through the years. And crypto matters because there's already something like $80 billion in securities being pledged as the backup for various crypto coins out there uh, in the market. The chairman has been very focused, uh, Patrick McHenry, on this subject matter, but creating the necessary consensus to move forward hasn't, uh, hasn't happened yet. And you've got a wide variation of opinion between Republicans and Democrats and within our caucuses over whether this is the future of transactions or it's a con game. And people like Sam Bankman Freed don't reassure by their actions members of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane Harmon, a former Congresswoman, was on with us yesterday, Congressman. And mm -hmm. She talked about a special moment, a couple of moments that took place yesterday where Americans from all walks of life came together. Unity. <laughs> around the eclipse as someone who serves not only serves on the science and space committee but chairs it i wonder your thoughts on the eclipse yesterday and how we might see more moments like that how did you watch it i was in southeastern oklahoma in the path of totality uh on a state nice. representative's farm and i will confess mm. i've never had that experience before it was incredible so in the coming years, my fellow citizens who didn't have a chance at this one or the previous one, when there are opportunities, we all need to experience this. It is just the most amazing thing. When the night lights come on and the, the wildlife gets quiet, when everything hushes down for that few moments, that few minutes, when it's totally dark, it really gives you an appreciation for the awe and yeah. magnificence of the universe and the amazing nature of science. So what did you learn about yourself in that moment? I learned that the money we spend on scientific research, the money we spend on NASA, the money we spend uh, to expand knowledge is money well spent. And over the course of centuries, major scientific uh, discoveries have been made watching uh, the totality of the eclipses of the sun, principles of, mm -hmm. of, of astrophysics and all those amazing things. We'll see what comes out of our experiences in North America uh, just yesterday, but it, it's something everyone should do at least one time if it's possible. Be there for a totality. I love that we could talk to you about this. Congressman, come back. Next conversation, I want to ask you about going to the moon with Japan. That's another story <laughs> that's emerging today. That's real stuff. Uh, great to have Frank Lucas, the Republican from Oklahoma's 3rd District. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. 
in Washington, where we are just now dealing with some breaking news, not from here in the district, but actually from the state of Arizona, a critical swing state in this election cycle. And the state Supreme Court has just ruled that a sweeping abortion ban can take effect. This is a rule or a law from 1864, about 160 years old, near total ban on abortion. It criminalizes abortion by making it a felony punishable by two to five years in prison for anyone who performs or helps a woman obtain one. So, Joe, taking what is we know a hot button issue, one that has shown the ability to galvanize turnout uh, in recent election cycles, including in the midterms in 2022. And now here it is potentially igniting Mm -hmm. in a crucial swing state. Yeah, interesting. There is uh, there is an exception here. That's this, the life of the of mm. the woman in this case, codified in 1901 and again in 1913, after Arizona became a state. Uh, look, this is just another reminder for yeah. voters that this is going to be an issue that they will have to factor into their decisions in November. And it's where we start our conversation with our panel today. Rick Davis is with us, Bloomberg Politics contributor, of course, longtime Republican strategist, joined by Brad Howard, Democratic strategist uh, now at the Corcoran Street Group. It's great to have both of you with us. Uh, Rick, you, of course, are a, a veteran of Arizona politics. How much of a concern should this be for Republicans running in that state? I think this is a uh, major concern for all the players in the state. Um, You know, it's not necessarily been a battleground for abortion in the past. This uh, law that you were describing, a Civil War era law, uh, hasn't been on the books really since uh, Roe v. Wade. But once it was overturned by the Dobbs decision, uh, the state had to reconcile its laws. And as the Supreme Court indicated today in Arizona, uh, this law still is on the books and, and now takes precedent. Uh, Arizona had a 15-week uh, uh, ban on abortion prior to that. Uh, and and the other thing that's happening that actually this just adds incredible amount of fuel to the fire, this decision by the Supreme Court in Arizona, is that there's a referendum that is uh, looks like it's going to wind up on the ballot. They're collecting signatures. They have over 120,000 more signatures mm-hmm. than they need today, and they keep going until July. But the group of abortion reproductive right advocates uh, are going to put on a 24-week ban uh, on the ballot. Now, this is going to be a huge fight in Arizona. And the fact that the law has now retreated to a Civil War era law is going to make it even more uh, dynamic in this regard. And this is a Mm. state that Joe Biden only won by three-tenths of a percent last time around. So anybody who tells you abortion isn't going to be a hot button issue in Arizona this year and may even determine the outcome of the presidential election in that state uh, doesn't understand how tight of margins Arizona has. Yeah, it's an excellent point, Rick. And of course, it's not just uh, presidential candidates that will be on the ballot. There's a critical Senate race as well in Arizona, Brad. It's Carrie Lake, the Republican, versus Ruben Gallego, the Democrat. And Gallego, right on cue, puts out a statement reacting to the (laughs) Supreme Court ruling saying, here in Arizona, we support a woman's right to an abortion, which is why I'm going to defeat Carrie Lake and fight like hell to protect abortion rights once and for all. Does this decision from the court make it more likely that he will do so? He will defeat Carrie Lake, or at least it's a lot harder for Carrie Lake now? Absolutely. And in full transparency, <clears throat> I'm a friend of, of Ruben Gallego, the congressman, uh, and, and know him well. And absolutely, he's going to take full advantage of this. He's going to bludgeon his opponent uh, time and again with this position. Uh, it is smart for him. It's going to consolidate his base. He's been consistent on this issue, and he's been a fighter in the House for reproductive freedoms. He will be in the Senate. There is no equivocation with Ruben Gallego. And, but also take a step back to the presidential as well. Keep in mind what just happened yesterday. Trump came out and endorsed Mm -hmm. uh, leaving this up to the states. Thereby, Trump is okay with this policy. He thinks Arizona should decide. Therefore, Arizona now has this as the law of the land, which Trump supports. So it's a reminder that Trump is the reason we are having these draconian laws back to the pre before the Civil War put in in place because of Trump's efforts to overturn, successful efforts to overturn Roe v. Wade, and now his position that each state should decide. So Trump owns this, and absolutely, you're going to see President Biden take advantage of this as well. And to remind voters time and again that Republicans' position on this is way out of touch with modern era and most swing voters. Brad makes a great point, Rick. I know that you questioned Donald Trump's strategy in making that announcement yesterday. A lot of people pointed to Florida. He didn't even weigh in on his own state. But you could also look at this as a tacit endorsement of every state's abortion policy, couldn't you? 
Sure. I mean, this is the kind of thing that just gives a campaign manager fits and starts. You know, they they do what they think <laughs> is right by releasing that. And then literally the next day, one of the key swing states has a Supreme state Supreme Court that throws this kind of thing over the transom. I mean, it's a disaster. Everybody who can get a microphone in front of Trump's going to ask him, so does this mean you endorse the state of Arizona's civil war ban and criminalization of abortion? I mean, I, it, what does he say, right? He's like, well, I thought I'd mm-hmm. lift it up the states. Um, it's a mess. Uh, and Florida, too, uh, another very key state uh, that Democrats are put, pumping a lot of money into right now because they have an abortion referendum that has come up on, on their state um, election cycle this year. So, uh, you know, it's going to be at least in those two states, a very, very big issue. Whether it trumps things like immigration or the economy, I don't know, but it gives Democrats something to talk about and and helps them push their turnout mechanisms uh, on this issue. So uh, I'd say this week advantage Democrats when it comes to Donald Trump's you know sort of non-position <laughs> states' rights thing on abortion. I mean, it looks like a disaster. And Joe, real quick, if, if I can jump in, the Florida ballot initiative is interesting because Trump can no longer just say states' rights Trump is going to have to vote as a private citizen in the ballot box on Florida's abortion question. So at some point, he's going to have to express that opinion. Yeah, it's a very good point. This was the conversation we were having yesterday was, has he basically avoided having to address a national, uh, a federal abortion ban policy by releasing the video he did yesterday? Or could this also be something that changes as, as time goes on, which is Definitely a question that the former president will have to grapple with at the same time, of course, that he's running a reelection to campaign. So it's great to have both of you reacting to this breaking news out of Arizona. That's not actually what we intended to talk with you about today, Brad and Rick, because today is the day Congress comes back and there's much to discuss there as well. Rick, how optimistic are you that this will be a productive week or even next week before they go back into recess again for the House? What actually can be accomplished in a short period of time when they've proven time and again that they have a lot of difficulty getting anything over the finish line. Well, the, the one thing I'm learning is not to read tea leaves in the House of Representatives <laughs> anymore. Uh, and I'd say that this is sort of bacon the cake week, right? They're going to have to figure out what they're going to do, how they're going to tee up some of these initiatives. We've talked about the FISA law needing to be reauthorized. We talked about uh, the Ukraine supplemental. Uh, these are really hot button issues, but there are half a dozen other really important issues that need to get dealt with, including new initiatives like uh, online privacy acts that that actually have a lot of political saliency out there. So uh, they they got to go to work. I mean, this has been the biggest do nothing Congress in history. Uh, they don't have a history of being able to enact laws, and I think that's going to be the real trick: is what can they get done in these two weeks to at least take something off the table before they take another break. Well, there's an important committee meeting, Rules Committee, later on today, Brad, where they're going to start marking up apparently a FISA renewal bill. Can this actually get done in the next two weeks? Could Mike Johnson say, see, I've got something to show for the fact that we came back to Washington? Look, the one good thing about the House uh, is the majority rule. The Speaker commits to something and his caucus is behind him. Absolutely. You can fly through things in in minutes. So there's, there's still time to get this done. And I think Rules is going to probably put together the structure of what the debate would be, and they'll insert the text, you know, when they reach that agreement, which is a, a typical way of moving the process forward. With, even if you don't have text, which is to the rank and file, very frustrating because you want to read these bills and have plenty of time to consider them beforehand. But keep in mind that you've also got the motion to vacate the chair that in any minute could disrupt the chamber. There are ways that Speaker Johnson could punt this to when they come back, um, but he's going to have to address it at some point if Marjorie Taylor Greene does move forward with the motion to vacate. So that's going to impact things. But, you know, usually on issues of national security, it's fairly easy. On these issues, he's got the history of the fact that usually speakers cobble together coalition from both parties. You don't need all your caucus to support. You look at the NDAA. That's the moderates of both parties and the extremes on both sides vote no. Similar thing here with FISA. So he's got some, uh, uh, you know, uh, his precedent here to not have to have full Republican support here. He can move forward as long as he's got 218 among the Democrats, I mean, among the moderates on both parties. So I think this could get done. Brad, just quickly, we only have 30 seconds left, but should Democrats ask for anything in exchange from Johnson if they were to save him? Should this motion to vacate actually happen other than Ukraine aid, or is that in and of itself enough for the party? Here, this is my concern with deals like that is you were, you were giving up a one-time thing 
or an ongoing speakership, right? So if I'm going to, I want to trade apples and apples, right? I want it to be even trade, not a one-time give for, you know, eight more months of governing. If they're going to do that, they need to have structural reforms to the house. So a power sharing agreement, okay. maybe they get control of the agenda for some key committees. Maybe they expand the number of Democrats on rules or ENC or mm-hmm. ways and means. That would be a fair trade, in my opinion. If you give us the chance to participate in governing, then maybe we'll save you. But if you're not going to give us any say whatsoever in the agenda or the priorities of the House, why would we save you? So I think there's going to have that's that's a fair conversation to have. All right, Brad Howard, Democratic strategist, and Rick Davis, our Republican strategist today. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.